podcast. My name's Marina. I'm a knitter, tech editor, dyer and spinner of yarns and I'm recording in Bath, a city in the southwest of England where I live and work. Um, this is a podcast about knitting and general yarny things um, and occasional bits of seasonal making as well. Uh, in this episode today I'm going to be sharing a couple of new things I've got listed in my online shop and I'm going to be showing you what I'm knitting at the moment and how I darn socks, super important skill, and how I infuse calendula oil. I say that as if it's something I do regularly, I'm doing it for the first time so you can learn with me. Um, so yes, I have been getting back into the swing of things after Yarnporium, a show I did at the beginning of November. Um, it was absolutely awesome. It was lovely to meet everyone who came along. Um, it was just really, really nice to actually get me and my yarn out in the world and see the lovely people who are going to be knitting things and subsequently see some of the things people have started making um, because that's something I really enjoy. Um, so since then I have got a couple new things that I've listed. First up is this lovely squishy yarn. It's a hand spun one. Um, I've mentioned before on the podcast that when I card up fibre for spinning um, I tend to keep all the bits that stay on the drum, um, on the drum carder. And so this is a lot of those bits that have been kept that I've blended together. Um, so it's lots of quite fine short fibres um, just in these lovely subtle like pinky yellows and brownie greys which I just really love. Um, and then I've got a couple of special colours of Mendip which I dyed up for Yarnporium and there are still a few skeins left. Um, so they're these ones. This one is called Olive, like duh, because look at it, it's just the colour of an olive. Um, I absolutely love it. It seems to sort of change colour every time I look at it. Sometimes it's a bit more grey, sometimes it's a bit more yellow. It's beautiful and squishy. Um, so this is dyed on the sunny base, so the naturally white base. And then this one is called Rogue. It's sort of, it's a subtle dark greeny purple and it's amazing. And that one is dyed on the Stormy, so the naturally coloured base. Um, so they're both four ply yarns. And tying in with that, I have a few copies left of my friend Alex Bird's book, Colour Knit Mittens. Um, I've shown it on the podcast before because I love the concept and I've been making um, mittens from it. You'll see those in a bit. Uh, and I'm doing bundles so that you can get any two skeins of Mendip yarn and a copy of the book um, for £25 on the online shop, which is a super good deal. And other than ne knitting needles is everything you need to make a pair of colourwork mittens, which I really love. And I'm going to make another pair soon because I love them. Um, so yes. That is what we've got to start, and I will now show you what I'm currently working on. So, knitting projects. I have had quite a bit of time to knit recently, which has been really lovely, because sometimes I don't get as much time as I'd like. Uh, often when I'm busy and I'm doing lots of other making type things. So, for example, when I was knitting, no, when I was dyeing up a lot of yarn before Yarnporium, I wasn't doing as much knitting as I would have liked just because, you know, you stare at yarn all day and you end up kind of wanting to do something else in the evenings. Um, one thing I did finish before Yarnporium though was my Mendit mitts, which I absolutely love. You're gonna notice a strong theme of orange today because I bloody love orange. Autumn colors are my favorite. Um, so these ones, I really love how they turned out. Um, yeah, they're, they're really cosy. They fit me perfectly. I can pretend they're glove puppets because these little bits at the top look like creepy little eyes. Um, 
and yeah, I really like them. Uh, one thing which, so at, a, at our knitting group, um, because Alex, the designer of the mittens and the writer of the book that they're from, is in our knitting group, um, a lot of people are now knitting the mitts, which is really nice to see like different patterns people are choosing, different ways they have chosen to use colour and their yarn choices, because it's really interesting to see, you know, mine are properly rustic ones, but then you've got people doing them in, you know, beautiful silk and cashmere blends and things. Um, the one thing I have been telling people is I messed, well, I didn't properly mess up, but because it was my first time doing the decreases like this, can you see there's like a little gap in between the two decreases. I'm gonna take one of them off so you can see better. So just like along there, between my knit two together and my SSKs, uh, I didn't quite pull the yarn tight enough in between. So there's a little gap there, but never mind. Uh, also talking to Alex later, we established that I had entirely misunderstood her thumb instructions, so I did it slightly wrong, but I think the thumb attachment has worked quite nicely. Um, so yeah, super pleased with those. Those are in my Mendip 4-ply yarn. Uh, the dark orange colour is Fox uh, in the Stormy base, and then it's got Fox Sunny for the bright orange and Leaf Stormy for the green. Um, on finishing these, I pretty much immediately cast on a new project, also using Mendip, also using Fox Stormy. Um, so I am making... I'm using a vintage issue of Pom Pom. I think it counts as vintage now, because, um, you know, all the excitement is about the new issues, uh, which is great and stuff, but I still have a few that I haven't ever knit anything from, so I'm going to try and work through, like, I want to say at least one or maybe two patterns from the ones I have already, and then I can start buying the new ones again. Um, so this one is the Rombiel. It's actually the one on the back cover. Um, and it was like the main thing. Well, that both of the cover patterns in this issue, I just bloody love. I I, th I love the geometric details. I love love the asymmetry of this one. Eventually, I'll make that one too. Um, the Rombiel, if I can find ah, more photos for you, it's just got so such good geometric stuff going on. So it's designed by Gina Rock and Wagner. Um, it's got these nice little dolman sleeves and this kind of, I suppose it counts as sort of lace knitting, but it's not particularly lacy. It just has some eyelets. Um, it's, it's awesome. When I was swatching, uh, oh, I'll show you the yarns I'm using. So I'm actually holding two yarns together because that's the thing I love to do. Um, it's something I talked a bit about in my newsletter um, because it, like a lot of people don't think to hold yarns together and it can be slightly annoying because it can be a bit splitty so you know you can accidentally knit both strands of yarn as separate stitches and it gets a bit messy. Once you're used to it it's not complicated and is a really nice way of combining yarns together. Um, so this one is the Mendip Fox Stormy, it's on the Stormy base, um, so it's an orange dyed over a coloured base. And then this is one of my new Kaya Alpaca, um, which is, is not a colour combination that should work, it's, it's like aubergine purple with like burnt sort of foxy orange and it, it just shouldn't work but I love it so much um and so I am knitting them together and unfortunately this you know it's oh that's the wrong way around there we go um I can't show it to you flat because I'm halfway through a row and I need to join on more yarn um but I love how this is going. Like, look at look at that texture. It's just you get this amazing tweediness. Can you see the colour properly there? Yeah. So you can see like the little highlights and the dark bits from the alpaca. Um, the fabric is a lot more drapey than 
it would be if it was just the Mendip on its own because the alpaca adds some drapiness, the Mendip adds some structure so it's not really floppy because alpaca on its own can do that. Um, and I just love it. I really, really like how it's going. I've been knitting fairly obsessively on it. I think I, I've been working on it for just, just under two weeks, almost two weeks. Um, and I stopped working on it last night because that was the end of my weekend knitting. And so this week I'm going to be working on a commission, which again, yarn held double, gigantic cake of undyed black alpaca. Uh, this is just the beginning. Um, it's going to be possibly the most boring project in the world. Uh, it's going to be a man's tank top, like a sleeveless pullover. Um, yeah, super exciting. I've This will be the fourth one of these I've done this year because um, I actually do them as commissions for the owner of the alpacas and he wants one in like a lot of the colours, so he's getting them in a lot of the colours. Um, and it's it's just nice, you know, you end up doing lots and lots of stockinette and it's nice mindless knitting, so it's really good for while you're watching TV and um, it's, it's more relaxing than having to, you know, follow charts and things, which is nice. But I'll probably, well, once I've made some progress on that, I'll let myself do some more on the rhombeal so then I'll be able to alternate because as I've mentioned before I'm just not a monogamous knitter I you know it would be easy to come up with slightly mean terms to describe my knitting style I'm going with desultry I like working a little bit on one thing occasionally I get carried away and work a lot on one thing and that's really nice but then sometimes I get bored of it and so I work on something else so if I'm working on something big I might alternate with something small if I'm working on something complicated I might alternate with something simple it's I find it a nice way of keeping things going like if you're a monogamous knitter and you are working on a jumper that's all in one piece like if you want to take knitting with you for while you're waiting for the bus or something are you really gonna take a jumper with you I mean you might but it makes your, your bag have to be much much bigger and that's just a pain so it's much nicer to have like a little something like a cowl or a pair of mittens um although the mended mittens were not allowed to be bus projects towards the end because I was working them two at a time, three balls of yarn for each because of three colours. Not not great for doing anywhere where entanglement might happen, so I ended up just keeping those at home and having balls of yarn for one mitten over here and balls of yarn for the other mitten over here and they weren't allowed to meet. Um, but yes, so these two are the main things I'm working on at the moment. I'm not going to show you my green and white cardon jumper, the one with the colourwork yoke, because I finished, well, I got very close to finishing the sleeves. I tried it on, the sleeves were again too tight. So I ripped it all back and once again, I am redoing the sleeves. Uh, eventually I'll finish that one. Who knows when it'll be because you know, it's, it's now in the naughty corner because that happens. Um, so when I have some progress to show you on that one, that will make it onto the podcast, but you don't want to see the same thing that's actually slightly further behind than it was last time because that's a little bit depressing. So yeah, those are the things I'm currently working on. I love this time of year. Um, I've mentioned it before. I'll probably mention it again. Um, I really like all the colours. I like the falling leaves. Um, I like that it's getting chillier because it means I get to wear a lot more knitwear. And one of those things is woolen socks. Like I, from about towards the end of September to probably mid spring, I'm pretty much endlessly in wool socks. Um, I like really, really thick ones. I wear a lot of boots, so that works with that. Uh, and I get really, really cold feet because I'm very tall and quite skinny and my feet are just really far away from me and it feels like the blood doesn't get to them easily enough to keep them toasty. So I get very cold feet, which is why I love them. And 
I don't know how much people watching are aware, but I'm very much sort of anti-nylon and superwash in yarns. I'm all about the natural fibres. And, you know, obviously this means that while there are some non-superwash and non-nylon sock yarns, um, they are still, not ones made from natural fibres completely, are still slightly less strong than ones with synthetic reinforcing fibres. Um, and I, I, a lot of people find that off-putting. I tend to just do a big relaxing session twice a year, usually about twice a year, where I just gather up all of the socks that are not looking in good shape and I just do a big old darning session and I really like it. Um, you, you don't have to think about it at all. Um, so I've got some socks here that I can show you. Um, these ones are sort of fresh darns, um, so they have been done, well, they've only been darned once. Actually, these ones I think have been darned twice. Um, so recently, when I've been darning, I've been doing a sort of bit of a visible mending type thing. It's just on the heel there. The heels are where they tend to wear through on me, like where socks wear through. Um, varies depending on the person because of you know just the way their feet are and the way they wear things like these that's that's not a normal place for me to have to darn socks this is because these used to be my husband's socks i accidentally chucked them in the wash and shrunk them without noticing he then didn't tell me so he was actually wearing the heel like there and oh my god i confiscated them from him and they are now mine i've darned them up Sometimes I have to do these things. Um, but yeah, and so I've been doing contrasting colours for my darning recently because I really like the way it looks and it makes it a bit more fun because you can come up with interesting colour combinations uh, where a lot of my socks are neutral ones because um, my parents live in South America and when they come over, uh, my mother will usually bring me a pair of sometimes hand knit, sometimes not, um, warm woolly socks, which is lovely. So I've got a couple of pairs here. Um, these are ones I bought in Argentina uh, many years ago, like 2008, okay, 10 years ago. Um, I wear them a lot. They used to be a lot bigger than this. I also, I do machine wash them because like, yeah. So I tend to buy them a little bit big and then machine wash them on a wool cycle, which is fine. So you can see on the heel there, they've been much darned. Um, and on the ball of the feet, they're looking a bit rubbish and they're beginning to wear through. We've got holes, it's all a bit carrack. So these ones are definitely, this, my previous darning is wearing through. So we're just gonna darn on top of that. Um, also, note, not great to wear undyed white socks because they tend to look a bit gross after a while if you're not washing them with like quite harsh chemicals. Um, again, these ones, they've been darned a little bit uh, and they're just wearing through on the heels. So also got another pair which don't actually oh that's that's an epic one look at that and with these ones it's kind of because the knit is like I'll show you these ones because these these again are very old I bought these in 2011 um I know these dates just from like what trip I got them on so these are alpaca ones and like these again have been shrunk a lot, but the yarn, like the spin style and everything just isn't really suitable for socks. Like you can see they've worn very, very thin there and they've been darned an incredible amount. They're eventually gonna get to the stage where there is no original sock left on the bottom. Um, but yeah, so I'm just going to darn over those thin patches before, um, before they wear through completely and become more holes. And so I like to 
you know, I, I don't I don't fuss about making the darning perfect because that's that's just not necessary. Like it's going to be a noticeable that they're darned anyway. And how often do people see the soles of my feet? Um, but you know, just doing it in a more not not slapdash, but doing it slightly quicker and doing it in a way that is just effective and fun um, means that it's less of a chore and it's nice to do. So I will show you very quickly just how I do that. So I've got my socks and first thing I do is I get my bag of scrap yarn, which is, this isn't my only bag of scrap yarn. That's a bit, um, I have a lot. Friends who are local to me collect up their scraps um and give them to me because they have no use for them and i am a weird hoarder like that so i keep hold of them so i go through i usually try and pick a yarn that is like ever so slightly heavier than the weight of the yarn used for the socks i'm doing because it makes it slightly faster and a bit more durable uh, i've picked out this one because there seems to be enough of it uh, and i like the way those colors work um, and you know, if there isn't enough of it, I can just add some more of a different or similar color on top, depending how I'm feeling. I've got my weird little jar of tricks, uh, which I actually really like. This was a, this was given to me by one of my fiber share partners, my latest fiber share partner, Anne. Uh, and it had little removable stitch markers in it. And since I've started keeping things like darning needles in it as well, because it's a really nice way to keep them all together. Um, if I can't find a suitable weight of yarn, um, like I can't, if I can't find something heavy enough, I'll usually just double up um, the yarn. That bit's too long. That's a good piece to start with. Um, Uh, do the one with the smaller hole to start with because yeah okay so we've just got the hole there and I just leave the yarn tail on the outside um, to start with and then I just weave them in later sometimes they pop out but never mind I like to leave my tails on um, so that uh, you know, it just, it just adds a bit of strength and makes it less likely that it'll start unraveling. So I just start weaving in and out, usually like one in and out per knit stitch. Um, but again, not being super precise about it because it doesn't matter that much. And obviously the smaller your stitch is, um, the stronger and neater it'll be. And where I've got the hole, I just pass the needle straight over it on this round because later um, when I start going up and down with the stitches rather than side to side, I'll weave um, in and out of the horizontal threads. And if the, um, if the knit stitches around the area where you're darning are weakened a bit. Um, you can go sort of further beyond where the hole is, or if you're just reinforcing just any area that looks a bit thin. Um,
trying to do this while actually letting you see what I'm doing is quite entertaining. And there we go. If I had more yarn um, on this piece, I would just keep that, uh, keep it going. Um, so you can see I've just got some horizontal threads going across the hole there. Thread. And having a non superwash yarn for this, I'm actually not sure if this is superwash or not um, because, you know, it's, I'm, I'm darning and they're scraps, so I'm happy to use whatever I've got. Um, Having a non-superwash yarn means that the darned areas will sort of embed themselves in the rest of the sock. Um, and so because the wool will felt slightly, um, it ends up just becoming part of the fabric, which I really like. And so here I'm just going up and down and I'm just weaving in and out of the stitches, uh, of the strands that go horizontally across the hole that I just made. And so that locks in um, the threads that I've added and keeps them in place and it adds strength. So it's a combination of like sewing and weaving, um, like tapestry weaving, which is why we use a tapestry needle for it. You don't want a tail on your yarn that's too long because otherwise it just gets messy and tangled. So I've done that. Um, you can see you can kind of see where my finger is underneath the stitches there. So I'm just going to go just across those bits a bit more just to thicken it up um, and add some strength because otherwise that will just wear through again. Um, usually it ends up being that when I have to darn a pair of socks that I've already darned, um, I'm stitching a new area and not an area that I've already worked on um, because the darning often ends up being stronger than the sock itself. <laughs> sock in too tight because uh, you don't want any puckering there. Now obviously some people use a darning mushroom um, which is sort of a dome shape that goes underneath like that so you can hold the fabric of the sock taut. Again, like you can use these things. I don't have one, so I don't use one. Um, I, I've used one in the past and found it didn't make an enormous difference to my darning technique. So it's easier just not to bother. Um, and so then I just get the little tails them through to the inside. I tend to work from the right side whilst darning. Uh, not entirely sure why, force of habit I guess. Um,
there we go. A little sock darn. And then on this one, I don't think there are any other areas that need doing, so I'll go and I'll now go and go and fix the massive hole on the other sock. And that's how I darn socks. So, well, you know, I'm quite comfortable with sewing, um, but you know, I've I've always mended things and I've always made things, um, and it's just a nice way to look after things. Like I'm not I'm not going to darn like cheap thin cotton socks that I get from the shop because honestly it just the fabric is so thin and it makes them uncomfortable and the holes are usually enormous and it's just not worth it but where possible I try to um well I wear my wool socks a lot more and so they're a lot easier to fix so hurrah our front garden this summer um, we've had a lot of calendula flowers growing uh, and they've been growing all the way from probably June and they're still flowering now um, so most of them I've been collecting the seeds which I just keep in this brown bag which I will go and sprinkle uh, out in the garden um, early next year and a lot of them have self-seeded as well like they grow really easily um which is i think is how these ones got there i think there were a couple and then they've self-seeded um but as time goes on i've been gathering up some of the actual flowers and then just leaving them on a paper towel like this to dry um and i asked on instagram what i should do with them because i know they have health benefits like people use them in tea um, and they're often used in salves and things. And a lot of, the, the basis of a lot of um, things you can make with it is calendula oil. So I had a quick look on how to do it and I'm gonna give it a go. Uh, I've got a jar here that I have um, rinsed in boiling water to make sure that there's nothing nasty in there. Um, and I've let it dry because we don't want any water in there. And I've got uh, the end of a bottle of olive oil here and apparently what I do is just put the flowers I mean some people just use the petals but I'm going to assume that the sort of heads of the flowers and the stalks will also have some use uh, so I'm just going to put those in there as well um, I did also use um, some of the petals earlier in the summer um, I made my own confetti for my wedding and so we used some of the petals in that as well which was really lovely. Um, so I spent all summer gathering flowers, um, constantly had either a sheet of paper or cardboard or something um, somewhere in the kitchen. Oh I've got a couple of geranium petals in there. Um, so yeah we also always had flowers drying in the kitchen and it's just a really nice thing to have done um, but with these ones I'm looking forward to putting them to some use and we'll see how it goes okay I'd say that's a decent amount um, probably appropriate for the jar. I might have to get some more oil actually because I think I'm just meant to cover the flowers with the oil. I'm gonna leave that dripping on there and I'm gonna get some more oil. So I'm using olive oil um, because in its own right, it's quite good for the skin and everything. And I am hoping to use this um, as a kind of moisturizing thing, so to treat sore bits of skin and things. Um, 
you know, when skin gets dry over the winter, it'll be nice to use for that. Um, you can use other oils, um, but as I have olive oil in the house, and I use it quite a lot for other things, um, it's nice to use. windowsill and I will shake it regularly to mix things up and it'll keep covered so it doesn't stay exposed to the sun but it keeps it warm um, and yeah that should be ready I think in a couple of weeks Thank you so much for watching. It's been lovely to chat a bit about what I've been up to. If you have any questions about anything I've talked about today or you'd like me to talk about anything specific in the future, um, let me know, send me an email or a comment or whatever. Um, if you want to see more of what I'm up to in the meantime, before the next episode, I'm on Instagram, Ravelry, Facebook, Pinterest, um, all as Marina Skewer. I'm Marina Skewer everywhere. Uh, yes, so until then, I'm now going to leave you with some scenes from a beach walk in Devon from a couple of weekends ago. I hope you enjoy and... Mm -hmm.